I've been uh, working on a framework for the last uh, year and a half called uh, FuseJS. And over the course of that time, um, I've learned several things. And so my presentation today is basically what I learned uh, creating FuseJS. Um, and so I'm going to go into uh, performance, uh, selector engines, and then a thing called sandbox natives. So let's get into it. All right. So the first part of uh, performance is um, reducing abstraction, um, basically simplifying things down to vanilla uh, JavaScript so things run faster. So in this example here, we have um, a function called times that takes a, uh, a method and a context and, and executes it a number of times. Um, and in this example, you see that there's the, the range and then a dot each. And so that's, that's where it's getting abstracted. And so we're going to go and just remove that and just use a regular while loop here. And it, it does cost a little bit of extra code, but what you end up getting is, is better performance. And so if you do this in, like, say, your entire uh, framework, you end up getting better performance overall because there's less, of, less uh, complexity and less function calls. So there's reducing abstraction. The next one is method forking. Uh, <laughs> method forking, basically, um, whenever you have um, browser capabilities, you want to do some kind of feature detection for them. In this case, this is a weak object inference, uh, basically saying that if this is truthy, um, then it assumes it can do all of these things. And same for this one and that one. Um, but what this is doing is this is for every execution, it's going through and checking it every single time. And so what method forking does is, is instead of checking it every time, you check it um, at the definition of the, the function. So you save on these checks every time. So I'm going to walk through that. OK. So first, we need a way to do a feature test for the various um, methods. And because these are host objects, um, host objects are things that aren't uh, native. Um, and so DOM is a host object. Um, so what we do is um, when you access these, these properties and these methods on host objects, um, they're implementation uh, dependent. So uh, they can throw errors. For example, element uh, dot offset parent um, on a uh, detached element will, will throw an error. So the best way to do that is by a type of check. And so basically what this is, is this is host object. Just checks to see that it's not a Boolean, it's not a uh, number, a string, or an undefined value, um, and not null. Uh, and it does so without doing like a for in or just a regular property access. So it avoids throwing errors when checking uh, for DOM methods. So that's that. OK. So this is just stepping down through the code. All right, so this is the, the fallback for the contains method. Um, basically, uh, just straight JS without, without having to use um, any particular DOM API. So this is what you always want to have as, as a fallback method whenever you do method forking. So in case a browser doesn't have any of these new fancy methods, you can at least fall back on a on a, a regular JS approach. So there's that one. And you notice it's, when it's checking it, it's defining the method here. So you can see that. OK. And now this is basically checking to see that it's got the compare document position method. And it's, uh, it's, it's using it now for this instead. Uh, and that's the only thing it is doing. So now whenever you execute it, it's not checking every single line. It's just going straight to the meat of the functionality. And then the last one there, it does it for if the method uh, element contains exists. So that's, that's um, method forking. You can also take it a step further and do things like um, lazy definition. Um, and what that means is uh, whenever you define a method, you don't actually fork until the first execution of that method. Um, and that's good for things like um, event wrappers, because you don't have an event object to start off with. And uh, the, the spin up for all of that just requires even more testing. So it's best to do it for something like that. So what that would do is, for lazy definition, is on the first execution, it then, it then defines, it rewrites the method and defines it again. So that's method forking. All right, the next one is memoizing. And um, basically, it's just a fancy word for caching. 
Um, and what this is is you just create a closure, um, create yourself a private variable, and use that as your cache. And so, for example, in this camel case method, you can then, um, this is a weak example, but you can then use it to, uh, instead of having to calculate and, and create the camel case every time for a given string, you can cache that. So the next time it comes through, you can then um, access the cache instead of doing the, the uh, computation on that. So that would be uh, caching. I wanted to just do a, a little bit on the performance. The rest of it is, is on selectors and uh, sandbox natives, but I, I wanted to at least get that through. So. All right. So my next talk is on um, CSS selector engines. Um, you know, everyone knows of Sizzle. Um, it's part of jQuery, prototypes using it now, um, Machi Kit. Um, and uh, there's, there's various other engines out there, too. It gets into some of the obscure ones over here. Um, but today I'm going to talk about uh, two of them and, and compare it to um, the, uh, an original one. And this is because whenever I was creating Fuse.js, I had to choose a selector engine because I didn't want to create my own. Um, and I, I kind of wanted a black box solution to throw in there. Unfortunately, um, as I started going along, I got sucked into it. And so now I, I know more than I ever wanted to about selector engines. So I'm going to go ahead and, and narrow it down. So we're going to narrow it down to uh, NW Matcher, which is used by my framework as a default and prototype as a secondary, um, and then Sizzle, which is used by uh, the other ones. So, so here we go. OK. So when looking for support, um, I'm using prototype as an example because it had to make the similar uh, decision whenever it was uh, choosing which uh, selector engine to, to use. And so a big thing to do is look at browser support and browser uh, compatibility. And so um, you can see it's prototype 1.6.1. Um, this is its browser, uh, supported browsers. And then you can see that NW Matcher supports um, as far back as Safari 2.0 plus. And then Sizzle supports Safari 3, which is inconsistent with prototypes previous support. So that means when they upgrade, they're going to lose compatibility. Um, and so, so that's, that's, an, that's an important thing to note. Firefox 2, um, I tested it, it worked, but it's, 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 a, it's a, a difference between Firefox 1.5, so it may be something to be aware of whenever you're making decisions about selector engines. All right. Okay, another thing to look at is the supported selectors per engine. Um, you can see that the legacy has, has quite a lot of, of supported uh, selectors. The, the gray here means it's not supported. Um, and then Sizzle, you see, loses support for some of these. So when users upgrade, they're going to lose support for these selectors. And if they had applications built off of them, their applications are going to break. So that is um, something to note. Um, and it gets really important whenever you go into browsers that don't have query selector all, uh, because those are the ones that need support for these. Query selector all likes to kind of um, even things out there. And then you can see NW Matcher has all of those, plus some. So. All right, speaking of query selector all, there's um, some bugs in query selector all. Um, and this is important because some frameworks will just dump to query selector all as a, as a quick go-to because they assume it, it, it's, it's working and uh, consistent across browsers, and that isn't the case. Um, there's, there's lots of uh, query selector all bugs, and there's actually more than is covered here. Um, there's there's uh, a lot more IE bugs out there, too. Um, so this is just an overview of which bugs each engine uh, uh, supports and fixes. And so you can see that they, they both have some kind of class name, case sensitivity bug, and then there's these, all these other bugs that are, are covered under NWMatch. OK. Now this is um, testing for a CSS selector, a CSS3 selector test, basically rules that uh, the spec defines on uh, tests. Um, and, uh, or this test is, tests the rules for, the, for those. And so basically, it's an unimportant. I'll give you links to the examples of these. But as you mouse over, it tells you what's failing from the spec. And so you can see here, there's a few inconsistencies um, between browsers, but not, not many. And uh, so this is, right now, this is the legacy. So this is um, IE8 uh, compatibility mode, IE8, uh, Safari 3, or Safari 4. Uh, Chrome 4, 
Firefox 3.6, and Opera 10.5 plus. So, so that's the compatibility for prototypes old engine right there. So now, now I'll do uh, uh, Sizzle. Okay, so here's Sizzle. And here's the, uh, you can see the tests that it's failing. It's failing quite a few more. But to be fair, it, it doesn't have support for a lot of those, those other selectors that I'm sure uh, this thing is testing. So keep that in mind whenever you're looking at this, is that um, this could be quite a lot of the, the selectors it doesn't support. So that's, this is Sizzle through the same browser range there. Um, and there is, there's slightly different results from mode to mode. But uh, you can test this out too whenever you uh, go to the, the test links. And then here is in W Matcher. So in CSS3 compliance. And so this is, this is its engine. Basically, the only problem it has is IE bugs with um, one where IE strips out certain attributes if they have default values or empty values. Um, so it actually removes it from the source. It removes it from um, the attribute method. So there's no way to detect it. The other one is... Uh, text nodes and how it strips out uh, new lines and things like that. And that will cause um, issues with like the empty selector. So this is NW match through all those. Now um, I'm going to get to, let's see. Now I'm going to get to matching. Um, basically, uh, selector engines can be used and matching can be used for um, event delegation. So whenever you trigger an event, you check to see if an element matches the, the selector, and then you're able to proceed on. Um, and so the speed of your match method is important because that affects the speed of event delegation. So this is a, a chart to show the, the matching speed of, um, of the various engines. And so you can see uh, the further over, the faster um, it is. And so you have prototype and sizzle and then in W matcher. This also tests some of the native um, methods that have been introduced in late in the, the newest versions of WebKit and, uh, and uh, Firefox that, uh, because they have their own matching methods now too. And so you can see like Firefox's native matching method is insanely fast, but WebKit's you know, isn't, isn't as fast. In fact, regular J, JS engines can, can beat it. Um, so that's the breakdown here. I don't know if you can see, this is, uh, this is Opera. That's actually 10.5. For some reason, the, the browser string says 9. Um, and then it, that's 3.6 for Firefox. This is uh, IE8. This is IE6. Um, this is Safari 4 and Chrome 4. Now for regular performance. This is a modified form of slick speed that uh, counts executions. Um, in a given amount of time instead of just three or four executions. So the higher the number, uh, the better. All right. And the number isn't representative of the executions. It's actually divided by uh, 100 or so just to make it a pretty number, or else it would, they would all be thousands of executions. So we don't want to see that. All right. And so a zoomed in view. You can see NW Matcher has 914, um, Sizzle has 296. Um, and then prototype has 292 um, the, for their old engine. And then you can see, uh, because prototype supports both NW Matcher and Sizzle, you can see that what their new speeds are whenever they're running under the new engines, which is 917 and 293. Okay, so if you're, if you're running prototype and you want to switch to NW Matcher, you have to rake it um, and select your engine. And so this will allow you to choose NW Matcher. OK, the next talk is on um, sandbox natives. Uh, basically, sandbox natives are a way to grab um, array, string, number, all of these native objects and constructors off of a different environment and import them in. And this is because. Um, you have issues with, for example, when you extend an array um, and you then do a for in on that array, you end up getting the contents of the array plus the new method that you've added to the prototype of that array. 
Um, and then this, this goes into explaining, the, in technical jargon, um, what it's doing. But you also have problems with frameworks. Um, for example, framework X defines a method, and then later framework Y defines their own method paving over them. And so when you define, when you extend natives like array and string and function and all of these, you run the risk of colliding into other frameworks and other projects that extend the same natives. Um, so that's, that's a problem. And for example, this is, this is a real world case where this is a uh, prototype and this is ext.js. They, they both do this. They, they really extend the same thing. All right, and in this case, we have a problem where a framework defines a method, or let's say your own code defines a method extending um, the array, and then later on, a different method with the same name gets added to the spec, uh, ECMA script. And so then you get issues where your implementation, which paves the other or may not, is different uh, than the official one. And so you get different results. And so this is an example of what else can happen wrong um, if you are extending natives directly on the window. OK, the solution is sandbox natives. Um, I'm going to go into a, just a brief example of sandbox natives and, and talk a little bit of how they're created. Um, I have uh, a series of uh, video casts that uh, talk about the, the whole process of sandbox natives and things. And all uh, the, the link to it was in the beginning. And I'll probably port back to it at the end. Basically, I create sandbox natives in three ways. I use uh, either an iframe. I use an ActiveX object called uh, ActiveX or uh, HTML file. Or I use the, uh, the proto property, which is the underscore, underscore, proto, underscore, underscore property. Um, and using those three ways, and I feature test for them so they don't, there's no browser sniffing there. Using those three things, I'm able to grab the uh, constructors or modify their, their prototyp uh, prototypical inheritance to, to, to new objects. So therefore, um, you're able to extend these and create real number objects, real, num real array objects, real string objects. And you're able to extend them without affecting the global um, array or number or string or, or object or any of those. And so this is an example of doing that. You can see where at fuse.array.prototype size, I'm extending a real array. Um, and then I'm returning a real array, and it has that method. But then the window does not have that because it doesn't touch the window. So that means I can then play with other third-party code that does, and it's not going to affect me. OK, the browsers tested for this, these uh, techniques are listed here. Um, it's quite a lot of browsers, and also uh, it's the, the various JavaScript engines. Um, because it supports the proto property, a lot of these engines also support that property. Um, and so you can actually run sandbox natives on the server side as well. So you, you can avoid extending the natives there as well. And so this is the browser supported there. OK, and this is the list of supported natives that I, I'm able to sandbox. I could probably do others, but this seemed to be uh, a good number of them. So it's array, boolean, date, function, number, object, regex, and string. And so that means you can extend these all, and uh, it won't affect anything. All right, so here's some usage of sandbox natives. You can create the string, but you notice that the string is not type of string. It's type of object, because it's not a primitive. Because if it was a primitive, it would be a primitive of the primary document. And then it, you wouldn't be able to have the sugar associated with the method. So what it is, is it's just like calling new string. It returns the string instance. And so type of is object. And you can say it's just like the new string, where the instance is an object. But what's neat is that it still has the internal class of string. So all the, the, fun, the frameworks that do is string or is array, they all check the class property. And so it's always going to return string or array or function. And then you can also chain, because chaining works, which, which required a little bit of uh, tweaking. So you can, you can use it just like you use your, your normal natives whenever you're extending natives. OK, so what's cool about this? Um, most people, when they think of uh, sandbox natives or something, will think, wow, I can use this for arrays, subclassing arrays, because that's, that's a pretty hot thing. So 
this shows an example of creating multiple, fuse, multiple sandboxes, or fuse boxes, as, as it's called on the namespace, um, to do different things. One has just regular array methods, but the other one's used for like a jQuery syntax. And you can see where querying returns an instance of node list, which has methods on it, like um, add class name or show. And so you can just chain all the way through. OK, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Fuse.js and what it has to offer. Fuse.js is a fork of Prototype.js. I started with Prototype and have been shifting it over uh, for the last year and a half. So I'm going to just point out some of the unique things that Fuse.js has. All right, Fuse.js is tested in IE6 uh, plus Firefox 1.5 plus Chrome uh, Conqueror. Uh, Opera and Safari 2.00. So it supports um, the older set of browsers that Prototype used to support in their previous version. Some of the neat things are sandbox natives, which allow for better third party and uh, browser support because of the issues that I described. I, I don't have any of those issues because I run, run um, them in their own sandbox. Um, Performance, what I've done is I've reduced the abstraction. I've used method forking um, by browser features to boost the performance of the engine because it's not having to go through everything. Um, another big thing is zero browser sniffs. I use feature detection, feature testing, and object inference to, to do this. And basically the difference between feature testing and feature detection is um, feature testing is like, is, I'm um, sorry, feature detection is like, um, a proper object inference. Object inference usually implies that you're testing um, for a property x and assuming function y. So feature testing is, is testing for the existence of property or, or method x because you're about to use method x. So, and then feature testing is actually executing the method, trying it, seeing if you get the outcome that you would expect. And then um, another neat thing is that uh, Fuse.js will support uh, framework emulation, which means that um, Fuse.js will be able to run as, for example, prototype. So all you would do is delete prototype.js from your project, um, then drop in Fuse.js, then plus the uh, emu emulation JS, and it will run as if it is uh, prototype. So your code doesn't have to change, but you get the benefit of um, increased performance, increased browser support, um, feature testing, and new features. So so that's, that's a pretty neat thing. And then as we, as we go along, we'll support other frameworks. And then another neat thing is that it's, it's debug friendly, which means I use um, function expressions, or uh, yeah, function expressions to um, create readable names whenever you debug into consoles. So whenever you, for example, put this method in the console, it's gonna spit back the name of the method and the, the arguments it accepts. And so whenever you do things like profile, on your site or use the Firebug profile, instead of having like anonymous function pop up all over the place, you're gonna actually have the full method there so you can see them. Other features are it's going to be modular. So because uh, there's less abstraction, there's less dependency between files and functionality. So you can build, you can create custom builds that say don't have array extensions or don't have the template or the range or the Ajax, or any of these um, things, because there's, there's no dependency on either one for the other to operate. Um, and then selector engines. I support seven selector engines, because I, I like giving developers a choice. Um, and so I support Dojo's Acme, uh, EXT, JS's DOM query, NW Matcher, Peppy, Sizzle, Slick, which is uh, MooTool's new selector engine, um, and then Sly, which is a, a variation of that. Um, I'll also be supporting quirks mode for dimensions and positioning code, which is something that um, some browsers or some uh, frameworks actually don't support. So like uh, um, jQuery, I think, dropped, dropped it recently. Um, Prototype has had problems with it. So I'm going to make sure that I support some quirks mode there. Um, other things is are, uh, I, uh, I do DOM wrappers, and I do event uh, wrappers for things. So I'm not extending the DOM either, so I don't run into the conflicts of um, names or, or um, issues where uh, things aren't being extended properly because of IE bug X 
or Firefox bug Y. So I have that. And another, another neat thing is that when I have DOM wrappers, you still have the functionality of, of extending things per element. So like in prototype, you could give just input elements a method like get value. Um, and in this way too, because this mimics the, the DOM classes, um, you can just give input elements a method or just give images a method to refresh or something like that. So that's neat. Um, I also support cross-frame or cross-iframe. Uh, communication, so uh, the method will still work on the iframe document, even though the iframe document does not have the framework loaded in it. Um, and that's because I avoid references to document or, or the global, and I, I resolve it by the element.owner document, and so I'm able to resolve the, the iframes document in these methods. Something else I do differently is um, I, enforced, uh, I enforce first in, first out event order um, when you're observing events. Um, and a lot of frameworks are doing this now, and it makes sense because uh, IE is the only one that really goes against the grain and has a random event order execution. But whenever you're observing events, a lot of times you want, you want your, your first observer to execute before your second, and so on. And, so you, and you expect that order, and so I make that consistent. Um, something else I do is I preserve backward forward cache, which means I don't have an on unload uh, handler to clean up the memory issues with IE because I avoid the memory issues with IE in the first place. Um, and so because of that, I don't have to break backward forward cache. And so whenever you flip between pages, the framework will continue to, the, the state of the page will still be preserved. And uh, so that's, that's, a, that's actually a pretty, a pretty cool thing there. Something else I do is I don't have any expandos on IE elements. Um, expandos affect screen redraw. Um, and things like that, and I found a way to avoid any of them on IE, so you don't get that performance penalty on IE. Um, or other issues like uh, whenever you clone nodes and things like that. Um, something else neat is I have method generics, which means that if any of you have used uh, or gone to um, Mozilla's MDC uh, site, you'll, you'll see that they have like array slice or array push, or these generics that are on the constructor instead of on the instance. Um, and so I have all of my methods support uh, generics as well. So anything that's on like the element uh, prototype is also on the elements uh, generic form too. Um, and then something else I do is I do separation of DOM properties and attributes. And this is, this is an interesting thing. As you get into a framework, you'll see that a lot of times they mix up um, DOM properties like element.checked um, and DOM attributes like element.getAttribute checked. Um, and which is, there's a difference there because attributes are source attributes, which means how they are when the page is rendered there. Uh, properties are live. So like the, the attribute value of an input element is what it originally was whenever the page loaded. Um, the live value is the element.value, which is the current input. And so I make a, I keep a separation there and I keep it consistent in the, in the method. So there's none of the confusion that goes along with it. Okay, um, this is going to be some performance tests with uh, Fuse.js Alpha. Um, you can see right now in its early stage, it, it runs about as fast as uh, jQuery 1.42 um, and is right around what Dojo uh, 1.4 is as well, or 1.4 or maybe 1 there. So that it's doing pretty good for itself at the time. Um, you can see prototypes is, is a little slower there. Um, so that's Fuse.js's performance. Now I'm going to show you Fuse.js's performance in IE8 and compared to prototypes performance in IE8. And in this case, um, less is uh, more because this is task speed. So you can see here that this is 2,000 something and this is 11,000 something. So the speed difference is pretty big for IE8. And then, um, last but not least, I mentioned that uh, Fuse will support um, framework emulation. And I wanted to show that I'm closer to prototype support now because you can see I'm getting proto Fuse.js to run as prototype. And you can see the performance differences right there. This is uh, 2,180, and this is almost 
th uh, almost 3,000. So the, the difference in speed is, is quite noticeable. Um, you'll have additional features, um, and uh, that is Fuse.js. Cool. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, I just want to make sure I understand that. You're saying you can emulate prototype faster than prototype can be prototype? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anything else? It seems like there's got to be a drawback to that. Well, the, 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 the issue is on performance um, is how they're designed. Prototype has a lot of abstraction in there because they like to use their own methods over and over. And at the beginning, I showed reducing abstraction. And so what I do is in Fuse, I have everything as vanilla JS. And so everything is stripped down to the, just the fundamentals. So that's what runs faster. Um, also, I do things like uh, forking the methods to create faster execution. And so when all of that's combined, um, you get faster, uh, an entirely faster framework. Another benefit is, is uh, because I don't extend um, the, the elements, um, I don't have a penalty for, let's say, IE6 or IE7 that doesn't have the element.prototype. Um, and so that's another way to be faster. Um, and so my, the idea is, is that as I go along, I'll, I'll keep optimizing. And then when I support other frameworks, I'll still be able to run as fast as them. Um, the reason I'm able to run as prototype is because I have all of my DOM methods are this generic, the, the little this keyword generic. Um, and that allows me to run as a node list, like jQuery syntax, or I can then run as, as just a, a single element wrapper, like the get the element by ID, and then it has the wrapper. Or I can then dump that back onto uh, the element.prototype to run as prototype, and the method still works, because it's this generic. It doesn't care that it's a wrapper or an element. It just works. And so it makes little, very little overhead to actually create the emulation layer. Yes? So Fuse.js, including the default NW Match or Selector Engine, uh -huh. how big is that compared to some of the other popular frameworks like jQuery with their engine, mm -hmm. and so forth? The goal is to get it to be around 30 kilobytes. Currently, in the alpha stage, everything is inflated because um, I've got the debug code in there and I've got other things. But the goal is to be right around 30 kilobytes um, or so. Um, and the size can actually change because you can create custom builds. So you can take out the things you don't want, like template or range, if you never use those, and just throw them out. And so it allows you to create a smaller, more focused file size. Um, also, uh, I have debugging uh, built, the, the debug-friendly function names. Those, those debug-friendly function names actually create an increase in file size. And so before you minify, there's going to be a pre-process that you can uh, run on the custom build thing. And it will strip out the named expressions and clean up. And so that helps reduce the size and keep it at a manageable limit. Um, Anything else? Yes? The sandbox names. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that there are three different uh, ways to do it. Mm -hmm. What is kind of the preferred order? What do you think is the one that you use in the optimal condition? Okay, in the optimal condition, I either use the ActiveX object or the Proto, because Proto is supported by everything. Um, and the ActiveX object avoids issues with like domain, document.domain settings with iframes. And it also avoids issues in Firefox with some iframe issues I had by removing and inserting. Um, and then the, I fall back to the last resort is the iframe. Now in the iframe, I should mention that um, Dean Edwards created a technique in 2006 to do basically the same thing with the iframe. But what he did was he left the iframe in the document. And that affects your window.frames collection. And so I found a way to to insert the iframe, grab the natives, and take the iframe out and cache it so it doesn't get garbage collected. Um, and so that allows me to use it without affecting the window.frames collection. So I guess the order would be um, proto, ActiveX, then iframe. Cool. Anything else? I'm getting a clap. All right, give me a clap. <laughs>